All right. I thought it was, but it wasn't. All right. A, they migrate south. B, they have antifreeze in their blood. C, they burrow four foot deep below the frost line. Or D, they put on extra body fat in the fall. Okay? What keeps frogs that live in the northern states from freezing in the winter? Okay? Because they, they in, the, in, the, in the spring, they're just not new frogs. They hop right out of the ground. How many think A, they migrate south? Raise your hand if you think that's the one. Oh, no snowbird frogs, huh? Okay. B, they have antifreeze in their blood. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. C, they burrow four foot deep below the frost line. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. D, they put on extra body fat in the winter. One, two. Okay, you see all those fat frogs in the fall. Okay, the point of these games are to just kind of have fun, but it points, the answer always points people back to our creator and the fact these things couldn't just happen. The correct answer, and the majority did not get it again, uh, almost, but not. They have antifreeze in their blood, <laughs> unlike humans. Frogs have a special blood chemistry with glycol. Glycol is the same stuff you use in the radiator to keep the water from freezing in your radiator. In their blood, even when frozen solid, ice crystals do not form, which puncture the cells. That's why we get frostbite. Water expands, punctures the cells, the cells end up dying. Doesn't happen with a frog. Uh, they are designed this way and are fine when they thaw out in the spring. Kind of cool. Last, last question. What bird can inflate and deflate microscopic water sacs under its skin, which allow it to sink in the water until just its head is above the surface? A, the loon. B, a penguin, C, a pelican, D, a cormorant, E, a flamingo, F, a seagull. Got a lot of choices this time. How many think the loon? A. One, two, three, four, three, five. Hey, no double voting. Five, six, seven. How many think a penguin? And obviously it's a bird that likes to swim under the water. One, two, three, four. A pelican? One, two, three, four, five, six. A comorant. You guys know what a comorant is? One, one of you do. Two, three, four. A flamingo? Nobody. Or a seagull? One, two, three, four. I think you got it this time. It's our local Michigan bird, the loon. By reducing its buoyancy, filling these sacks with water allows the loon to dive deeper and longer than most other, other birds. Loons have been documented to hold their breath for as much as 15 minutes and swim two miles underwater. So, there we go. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you a little clip again later from these Rocks Cry Out series. Uh, phenomenal teaching for any Bible school, Bible study, homeschooler, church, Sunday school class, etc. Um, but the lecture I'm giving now is new since I've developed those 18 lessons. Uh, and this is sort of the finale of our week together. And um, I hope you'll really, really like what the Lord put on my heart for this final lecture. And, and what the impetus of it was that as I go around and speak, and I've been speaking in churches, uh, in, in schools, but uh, mostly churches, I would say, over the years, I almost never fail as I'm at the book table to have a parent or a grandparent come up and, and, and say, you know, my kids were raised in a church, but they have no interest in God or the Bible. They, they've heard it all. They, they, even many of them had a profession of faith early on, but they're just zero interest in going to church or studying the Bible or having anything to do with Christianity or God. And I, I just, I don't know what happened. And I thought about that a lot. Um, and, and I really think there's a couple things going on. Our entire world around us, ever since, and this isn't new, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, what was their first response when they sinned? 
to hide, to hide from God. And literally, I think that fig leaf is a, is a kind of a symbolic attempt to cover their own sins. Just kind of do something to cover their own sinfulness. Hide from God, cover our own sins. And that's what religion is, an attempt to do something to make up or cover our own sins. And it never works. Never, ever works throughout the ages. So that's always been going on, and that's part of it. The, the, the whole world system leaves God out of their thinking, or they, they, they make God in our image um, instead of God being who he is, which is both righteous and just. But the second thing, and I think this is kind of precedes this leaving God completely out, wanting nothing to do with God, is that people lose their awe of who God really is. And awe is the root of the word awesome, okay? And life just does that to all of us. It just beats us up. I mean, between sicknesses and disease and having loved ones die early or children or relationships falling apart or financial problems or work problems or uh, being stabbed in the back and lied about and, and misused and abused. It's just life beats us up. And, and we just start focusing on all that stuff. And we lose this awe of who God is. Now, we're going to talk about the awe of God tonight. But I'm going to start with, a, with a, what is in essence a parable. But it's kind of a story. And I'm going to take you to what's considered the greatest artist of all human history. And that's Michelangelo. He was both a sculptor and an artist, and his work is just fabulous. And at the height of his career, the Pope told him, I want you to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel uh, over in Rome, the entire ceiling. And it wasn't just paint it. It was fresco, which means you're mixing paint with plaster, and you're actually spreading the plaster to make the painting. It's way more difficult than just painting with paint and a brush. And this ceiling is enormous. You had to build scaffolds, lay on your back, and day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year work on this. And Michelangelo didn't want to do it. Michelangelo, at this point in his life, wanted to sculpt. He wanted to have, build these enormous, beautiful uh, sculptures of every shape and form. But you don't turn the Pope down. So he did it, and I'm told it took him two to three years to finish this, working constantly. Uh, historians say he lost his eyesight doing this. He, he was semi-blind by the time he was done. Now, this is what I want you to do. Imagine you are the child of Michelangelo. You're his daughter or son, and you're in your, I don't know, 10, 6 to 15-year-old age, and you, and you want your dad to spend some time with you. And you say, Dad, you going to come home early tonight? Can, you, can we just read something together? And he said, nah, I'm going to be working late. i got to work on this thing. i got to get it done. Dad, got this game. Can you come to it this weekend? Nah, i got to keep working. i got to get this done. Can't trust anybody else to do it. So for years, you don't even basically see your dad. And by the time it's done, you're off being apprenticed, doing something else, and you just have this resentment of, you know, the church and the time that was spent and the loss of the time you would have had with your father. And decades go by, your father dies, and you're getting up there in years, and you just think, well, I want to go see this chapel. I want to go see this work of art that my dad made. So you go back to Rome, and you join a tour group. And the tour guide is taking you through, and he's bringing the group through, and he says, this ceiling is an absolute miracle. The beauty of it. And this is what happened. You see, decades ago, water started leaking through the roof, picking up minerals, and pictures started to appear on the ceiling of this chapel. And year after year, they became clearer and more distinct until finally, all of these beautiful Bible scenes formed just by this random process of water picking up pigments and forming these pictures here on the ceiling. What would you think as you were standing there with that tour group? What would your feelings be? Hurt? Anger? What was that? Pain. 
paint? <laughs> it's okay, the paint's on the ceiling. But yeah, I would be, I would be livid. I'd be absolutely disgusted, angry. Uh, you're being lied to, you're being deceived, and so is everybody else. The credit for the one who did it is just being totally denied and ignored. Now, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? That's exactly what's happening all around us. We are the children of God. We absolutely know the truth. And yet the world around us is being lied to about where something a million times more complex and beautiful than a painting on a ceiling has come from. And it's being said with a straight face as if it's an absolute fact, and people just believe it because that's what they're hearing. So that's where we're at. And not only does it deceive people and leave God out, which is bad enough, the first step of that walking away is losing that awe of who God is. Now, all of us, we don't see God. There's times we don't feel God's presence, but we never are unable to see what he has made. It's always right there in front of us. So that's why all this, this is so important, and I'm going to start walking you through some things. But before I get to some of these just things that have stunned me that God has made, abilities and parts and features of different creatures, um, I, I want to take you not to uh, Genesis. or uh, Creation is mentioned from cover to cover in the Bible, mostly in Genesis. I'm going to take you to the second most important creation book in the Bible instead of the first. And that is the book of Job. Now, Job is the oldest book in the Bible as far as the historical stuff that it talks about. Um, I, I mean, when it, was, when it was believed to be have pinned and the, the events happened. Now, the things that happened in Genesis are older, but Moses didn't write them down until about 3,400 years ago. So the Bible places creation in the 6,000-year range, and there's lots of scientific evidence that supports that, and there's no absolute way of, of proving by some dating method when something happened. So it's all based on assumptions and faith. Um, but Moses got his information from somewhere. It may have been just divinely just given to him, but I suspect that's not the case. I suspect that Adam, who walked in the garden daily with God, and God told him all sorts of things, God revealed stuff about creation. He passed it on to his kids. There was 1,400 years from creation until the flood. No, actually 1,600. And uh, Noah took documents with him. They ended up in the hands of, of Moses eventually that became the book of Genesis. I think that's the most logical, easy way of understanding where the information came from. Don't know it, but it's very logical. Job, on the other hand, happened shortly after the flood, within hundreds of years, probably after the Tower of Babel. A um, couple clues. It says Job had 10 sons and daughters. Uh, he was highly revered. He was a leader among the people he lived with. Um, so he wouldn't have been very young, probably in his 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And it said he lived 140 years after the events of the book. So he lived about 200 years. Abraham lived about 200 years. Lifetimes continued to drop off radically until the time of Moses when lifetimes were 70 to 80 years. So it was probably in that same time period as Abraham or maybe a, dec a century or so before that Job was, was, the events were happening. It contains incredible scientific insights. That's a whole other lecture. Talks about the earth floating up on nothing. Talks about the weather patterns. Talks about ocean patterns. Talks about the abilities of creatures and things that we don't even have, that aren't even alive today. Uh, but most important, it addresses the issue of pain and suffering. Because that's that first thing I mentioned of life beating us up. This is what drove Charles Darwin to try to destroy people's belief in God. And by the way, Charles Darwin, when he proposed this idea that one creature could turn into another as an explanation for where everything came from in 1859, he had been thinking along these lines for 30 years since his famous voyage. Uh, and he'd written all this stuff down, but he just kind of sat on it because he knew what he was doing was undermining and destroying the belief in the Bible and the belief that God exists with what he was proposing. 
It wasn't until his eight-year-old daughter, Annie, died that he was so mad at God. He thought, if things are millions and billions of years old, things have been living and dying for millions of years, all that death we see in the rocks have always been going on. There's always been cancer. There's always been death. So if God exists at all, he's the one that just made death and disease long before mankind even existed. Who is this God anyway, if he even exists? And in multiple letters... After he proposed evolution, the scientific community didn't just immediately believe it. Most of the original scientists were literal Christian, Bible-believing, creation was 6,000 years ago, believers. It didn't hinder any of them from developing modern science. I'm talking about Isaac Newton and Michael Faraday and Lord Calvin and Louis Pasteur. All these guys believed in a recent creation. But in the middle of the 1800s, Charles Darwin wrote about 5,000 letters over the remainder of his lifetime, constantly writing, promoting, writing, promoting. And in many of these letters, he said, and this is a quote, my goal is to kill God. That was Charles Darwin's goal in people's thinking and belief. By proposing everything can be explained without God. So that issue of pain and death if you're logical, if it's always been around, really is huge, even in our world today. You ask a lot of people why they don't believe in God, they'll say, look at all the death and evil around us. God's either not able to stop it or he doesn't care. Because they misunderstand history. They don't understand death is this because of our rebellion against God. And if he didn't bring death into creation, we would continue to live forever separated from him if there was no death we'd just live forever and we'd always be separated from him so God took the penalty upon himself as payment for what we deserve see Christianity starts back here with creation and the events not other places and lastly I think the book of Job provides the ultimate solution for what to do with all the problems and, and the struggles we have in life and I'll get to that in a moment So, just going to spend 10 minutes talking about Job. And all of you know the story. Uh, Job was incredible. God said he is the most righteous, the greatest, most obedient of every human being walking on the entire planet Earth. He set Job up as an example of righteousness of mankind. Now, not perfect righteousness. He was still a sinner. But he did his best to obey, follow, and do good, and follow God. And Job had seven sons and seven daughters, had huge amounts of stuff, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 oxen, 500 donkeys. He had a great household with lots of people working for him and providing employment. And this man was the greatest of all the men in the East, probably the main part of the world of that year. Okay, so there's the man. Well, The back story is he was allowed to be tested. God allowed it. And God allows everything that comes into our life. Nothing's going to happen that God hasn't allowed. He could stop anything. Um, And in a matter of a very short period of time, I don't know if it's days or weeks, he lost everything. All ten of his children died from a natural disaster. God could stop a natural disaster. All of his wealth was totally destroyed. Every building, every herd, every animal. And he came down with, I think, what had to have been the most painful, horrible disease imaginable. Every inch of his body was covered with oozing, just breaking open sores with an unstoppable itch. And he's scraping himself with pottery and he's bloody and oozing and in total, constant agony of every part of his body. Now, that's the situation. I I mean, he goes from the epitome of of having everything to the depth of having absolutely nothing. No wealth, no health, no relationships. And um, what was Job's response to all this? I love this. His response was, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return hither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How many of us could do that? This was quite a man. And in all this, 
Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. Now, there are 30, I believe, six chapters of a dialogue coming up. Half of them Job, half of them his friends, all trying to convince Job that the reason all this is happening is because you have sinned. You've brought it upon yourself by something you've done. In essence, this is the greatest test of all. You understand what's really being said is, if you will just follow a set of rules, then you will get blessing. If you will do everything right, then everything will go right from you. In essence, your salvation depends upon your actions. That's the essence of what is being told to him. And Job refuses to, to, to do it because he knows that isn't true. It's ultimately up to God, even, even our blessings and our salvation, not our actions. Although there's a natural, you sow what you reap consequence in the world. This wasn't a result of that. Um, and my favorite verse in the whole Bible, I love this. This is, this is over 2,000 years before Jesus came to pay for our sins. Job makes this statement in the middle of it all, in the middle of the pain and anguish. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall in the latter days walk upon the earth. Isn't that cool? Okay, now, where am I going with this? After all this temptation and Job refusing to give in, although he is in such agony, he says, I wish I had never been born. Now, here's another lesson. Job, in 30, yeah, I think 36 chapters of Scripture, not once, and with all of the mental pain, the physical pain, the emotional pain, the total despair that he was in at times, did he ever contemplate suicide? Never entered the, the discussion. Because he knows life belongs to God. Our life, others' life, unborn babies' lives, they belong to God, not us. And he never contemplates that. So it just he's trusting God. And he finally, after begging over and over and over again, God telling him, why is this happening? Why am I in such pain? Why are you allowing this? Why, what is going on? God never answers that question. But God does a four-chapter monologue about creation. All he does is talk about what he's made for four chapters. Verse after verse, line after line, chapter after chapter, page after page, what God has done. And he starts by saying, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it if you have such understanding, Job. And he goes on to list thing after thing, animal after animal, water cycle of the earth, how everything's put together, how it all works, and so on. And after all that's done, Job's response is this, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withheld from thee. God even knows our every single thought of our head. I uttered that that I did not understand. Things that are too wonderful for me, which I knew not, I heard from you, I heard from thee, with my ear, but now my eyes have seen thee. Therefore, you know, I, sh I shouldn't have been complaining, in essence. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, I underlined this one section. Job basically said that he had heard of, some, of God and all that God has done with his ear in the past, but now he's seen with his eye. Now, did Job see God standing there talking to him? What do you think? Was God just standing there physically talking to Job? No, he heard it. He, I mean, he may have had a vision. What did Job see? As God is talking, what is Job seeing in a way he's never seen it before? All the things that God has made. That's what he's talked about. Look at who I am by looking at what I have made. God was reestablishing the awe of who he was in Job's mind by showing him the things that he had made and having him look at them in a different way. Now here's my point, and then I'm going to kind of hopefully 
reestablish a little bit of that awe with everybody here tonight by looking at some of the things God has made. One last thing before I do that, before I give you a summary of Job. So this is like one of the last few verses. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. He gave him 14,000 sheep. He had 7,000 to start with. 6,000 camels instead of 3,000. 1,000 ox instead of 500. 1,000 donkeys instead of 500. What did he, how, how many more did he have? He doubled it. He doubled everything. And he also was given seven sons and three daughters. How many did he have at the beginning? Ten. How many did he have after everything happened? He didn't double them, right? Wrong. If God had given Job 20 children at the end, he would have in essence been saying, those first 10 don't exist anymore. They never existed. You now need 20. But by giving him 10, what God is telling Job and all of us is that life doesn't end at death. Our physical life ends. But those children are not non-existent. It's not like they never existed before. Their soul and their spirit It goes on. Right there in this ancient book is this teaching that life doesn't end at death. Job still had 20 children. Ten of them were just now dead. We're all going to die. But it doesn't mean we end. He gave him 10 more. He did double the number of Job's children. Isn't that cool? What hope when we're lost in the anguish of having lost a loved one. They're not gone. They're just, we can't see them anymore. They've stepped through a door that we too will ultimately step through. I think that's a phenomenal reassurance for all of us. So in summary, it's a fabulous book into the insight of God's character. Pain and suffering is not caused by God, but it's allowed by him with a purpose that we will grow and strengthen and have perseverance and gain empathy and be able to help others going through the same thing. Trusting God in times of suffering will be rewarded. We just don't know how and when, but it will. Job ends by reminding us that life is not all there is, and we're not just gone when we die. And lastly, By focusing upon God, and the easiest way to do that is by focusing on what he has made and and also focusing on what he's done in our life in the past, that will move us past focusing on ourselves and our problems. So if we just sit and have a pity party about how terrible it is, we're just going to spiral downward and and we're going to lose the awe of God and we're going to just, it's going to get worse. And this is pointing us to where our focus needs to be in the midst of problems. I mean, it had a great book. So many cool lessons. But you notice how it comes back to creation. So, now we're just going to do that. We're going to look at some things God has made. Now, I'm going to start really little. I'm going to start with a creature called a pterograde. Now, this guy's called a water bear. And I put this picture up here because it's ironic. About two years ago, I was over in Wisconsin. My, my youngest son lives there. And he took us out to a corn maze. And this corn maze is about 50 acres. I think they said it was, if not the largest corn maze, one of the largest corn mazes in the world. Uh, So this guy's longer than a football field. And yet, in real life, I want you to hold your fingers together. So so your forefinger and your thumb. Get them as close as you can get them without them touching. That's how long this guy is, okay? Okay. He's microscopic. I mean, you have to have really good eyes and get really close to even notice that he's around. Uh, Smallest animal that God has made that has legs. So he's not a microorganism. He's literally a little tiny animal. Um, About half of a millimeter long. That's like a 64th of an inch. Okay? He's semi-transparent. You can all see through him. But if you use your microscope with the light right, this is what he looks like. Isn't he cute? He's just like a little teddy bear, okay? Now, the cool thing about a pterograde is scientists have discovered this guy is really, really, really hard to kill. And they've tried it a whole bunch of different ways. Let me share a few of them. 
First of all, they found out they can't asphyxiate him. They can put him in a vacuum, like they could send him into outer space and leave him there for weeks, days, and months with no oxygen whatsoever. And when they let the oxygen back in, he just starts crawling around. So he can live for like indefinitely with no oxygen. Just starts crawling around once he gets oxygen again, just kind of goes to sleep. So you can't kill him by taking away his oxygen. They found out you can't irradiate him to death for the most part. I mean, sure, there's some level where you could, but you can increase the radiation a thousand times higher than what was around us that gives us skin cancer and keep it on him for long periods of time and it doesn't seem to have any effect on him or the next generation. So God built him to this ability to avoid radiation death. You can't crush him. You can put him in pressure that's like a thousand atmospheres. That's six times more pressure than the deepest ocean on Earth, which goes down about 10 miles. Uh, it's literally like if he's laying there, you hit him with a hammer, whoop, and his body just squishes down and pops back up, and he doesn't die. Pretty cool, huh? Like, this is the super, this, this is like the Wolverine. Anybody who's ever watched the X-Man, this is like the Wolverine of the uh, animal world. He just doesn't die. Here's another picture of another kind of him. Lots of different varieties. He's not quite as cute, but got those eight legs, like a little moving tank. Uh, you can't boil him to death. You can put him in boiling water, come back an hour later, cool the water down. He's just swimming around there in that boiling water. Pretty cool. So let's see if we can uh, dehydrate him without water. They found these guys in dry tombs with 0% humidity that have been there for like hundreds of years. Uh, he's all dried out like a piece of dust. Add a drop of water, bloop, and he comes back to life after laying there for hundreds of years. Isn't this cool? And you can't freeze him to death. They've taken him down as far as they can get close to absolute zero. Uh, found him in frozen glaciers that they think are 3,000 years old, frozen. They thaw him out, and he's still alive. Now, you take any other animal that couldn't be frozen and live, it, you, it's not going to slowly develop that ability. You take an animal that can't survive freezing and you freeze it, it's not going to evolve the ability to survive freezing. All of those complex chemicals and changes and structures of its cell that are needed have to be there before it ever happened the first time. The same with boiling. The same with living without oxygen. The, the same with uh, being able to squish out its body and pop right back. Everything that's needed structurally and chemically had to have been there when it was designed or it could have never survived it the very first time. It's not going to happen a little step change at a time. God made this critter. It's like, it's awesome. He's the superhero of miniature animals. So then, here's the superhero you can't kill. Now we're going to look at the superhero with another superpower that no other animal that I know of can do. This one can become invisible. God created an animal that can make itself invisible. Now, it took scientists a decade to figure this out. They've known about them for years. They're called sea sapphires. Uh, here's another picture of it. They're this beautiful sapphire blue color. Now, this time, they're about a fourth of an inch long. They're not very big. They live by the trillions in the ocean. They, they live in groups in their certain areas of the ocean. And when they turn a certain direction, they, they literally disappear, and you can see what's behind them. It's like you're looking right through them. They become invisible. Now, they couldn't figure out, how do they do this? How can something just disappear? It's there and then it's not. And I'll show you a little movie in a second. Turns out it's it's, the inside of its body is very translucent. It's just filled with fluids, and the, the proteins are very clear like water. They've got all sorts of chemicals, but you can see right through them because it's like dissolving salt in water. The salt's there. The water contains lots of stuff, but you can see right through it. That's what their bodies are like. But on the outside, they're covered with little scales like a butterfly. You, you know how a butterfly shimmers? That's because the light hits it at different angles and reflects off different colors. Well, these scales, they're also lined up on the body of this sea sapphire. Like there'll be a set of scales here and a set of scales there. And as light comes through it, all of the wavelengths of light pass through the first set of scales, hit the second set, and only blue light bounces back. 
All the rest of them are absorbed. All the light colors are absorbed except for blue. That's why it looks blue, because the light blue comes back. But when that animal turns at an angle, like this, now when the light goes through, it has to pass through a longer pathway, and the blue gets absorbed, so the whole spectrum of colors is absorbed and nothing black bounces back. Now normally, what you would see would be black, because it's now nothing's bouncing back and you're seeing black. But instead, those scales become transparent. You can see right through them, because nothing's bouncing back. Its body is like water. It becomes invisible. You just look right through it. Here's a little film, and it's going to loop several times. Of the, now here it is, and watch when it turns, you can see the ocean right underneath of it. It disappears, becomes invisible. This is awesome! God created an animal that becomes invisible. It's like, this couldn't just happen. The design is phenomenal. Ten years to figure out how it could do this. And yet God just made it for our amazement. I want to look at honeybees. Everybody knows about honeybees, and we've studied them for... The Egyptians had honeybees for thousands of years. Well, way back in the 50s, we discovered that honeybees can communicate. They have a way of letting other honeybees know where, like, really good fields of flowers are that have lots of nectar. They come back to the hive and let the other honeybees know, and then they all go and find it. Well... A few years ago, Princeton University researchers decided, let's figure out just how smart honeybees really are. Because they have a brain about the size of a grain of sand, you know, and we've got these great big brains, you know, about a million times bigger, and we're going to use our brains to just figure out how smart is a little grain of sand brain. I mean, they can communicate, but can they learn? So this is what they did. They performed this experiment where they got a whole bunch of bees, and in a certain hive, they marked the bees with some sort of radiation so they could sense exactly when those bees would show up at a certain flower. And then they put some, uh, a real rich source of nectar about 150 foot away. They basically stood there and waited for the first bee from the hive to show up. And they knew when it happened and they, they would start a stopwatch. That bee would fly back to the hive and let the other bees know where to find the nectar. And they wanted to know how long is that going to take. Well, this is what happens. The bee flies back, and let's say this little bee right here, he's wiggling his butt, okay? He flies back to the hive, and he does a little dance. He takes his butt, and he goes wiggling his butt, okay? And he goes walking around the hive with his butt wiggling, okay? And what he's doing is communicating. And this is what scientists figured out years ago. The direction in which he does his little dance is exactly a certain angle from the direction of the up and down honeycomb. And that tells the bees exactly how many degrees from where the sun is at at that moment they have to fly in order to find the flowers. Isn't that kind of cool? And the number of times he goes around tells them how far they have to fly to get to the flowers. Now, let's stop right there. Supposedly evolution did all this, okay? Somehow, way back when, a bee thought if it, can, it figured out that if it can communicate, it has an advantage for its hive because it can tell all the other bees how to get to a good source of food. So suppose a bee finds a really good source of food and he comes back to the hive and he starts wiggling his butt and walking through the hive. Are the other bees going to know what he's doing? Absolutely not. It's like, oh, George is having an epileptic fit. They're not going to know it's lined up with the sun. They're not going to know how many times he goes around is going to mean anything unless they have been programmed by God to know all this stuff and to do all this stuff. It's going to do or mean nothing. It's not going to accidentally develop. See, evolution is just, it, it's, it's silliness. It's God does these things so we'll know he exists in wonder and awe. So anyway, it took about 10 minutes which kind of surprised the researchers. From when it left, it was 10 minutes before the bees from the hive showed up. So then they moved the honey another 150 feet, kind of in, the same, in, in one direction. Started the stopwatch. They thought maybe it'll take twice as long. It was still 10 minutes. Didn't seem to be dependent on distance. They moved it 450 feet. You know, waited for the first bee to show up. 
to hit the stopwatch, 10 minutes later, a bunch of bees from the hive showed up. This is what was astounding. They then picked up the, the whatever it is, this rich source of nectar. They walked in that same line another 150 feet out, put it way out here 600 feet away. The bees from that hive were all buzzing around that spot waiting for them to show up with the, with the nectar. These little grain of sand brains had seen the pattern, had calculated the distance, and in advance of the researchers were out there waiting for them to show up with the food. Isn't that cool? So cool. The awe of the God who did all this. Now, for this one, I want to share one of these little um, two-minute videos because I want you guys to understand the tools I'm trying to put in your hands to reach a blinded world around us. And th these videos are really cool tools. That newest book, about twice a month, you'll see these little QR codes. And if you uh, follow it, you can, you can kind of put your email in, and whenever a new video comes up about once every week or once every two weeks, it just shows up on your email, and it's that little reminder God's behind everything. Uh, so I want to show you what these look like, and I've got to pull up, um, gonna, I'm going to drag this over, and I'm going to enlarge it. And this, this one talks about a slug. What can we learn from something as nasty and kind of ugly and irritating as a little slug? Oop. There we go. Now the problem is my cursor is over here. There we go. Okay. So now I gotta, what do I gotta do? I'm gonna get rid of this. Okay, I'm back. So I, I think it's, we just all need that reminder. Yeah, you know, every now and then that God's behind it all. So these are kind of a great little tool to just have this uplifting thing God has done as a reminder. 
So let's move along. I got probably four or five more of these, um, and, and there are just there are thousands of them. These are just some of the less common ones I've discovered that I just think are really cool, and include that teaching of, of how obvious it is it couldn't have done itself. Uh, and this is one of those. This is a fish that does what no other fish in the world does. It's called the Oopu fish. It only lives in one spot in the ocean off the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, and uh, it's like a salmon. It lives in the salt water, but it has to lay its eggs in the fresh water. But it's a little tiny fish. It can't swim. It doesn't swim like long distances away from its home. Uh, and the only source of fresh water near where it lives is at the top of this 420 foot waterfall in Hawaii. Now, if that fish lays its eggs in the ocean, they're gonna die. No more opu fish, it goes extinct. If it lays its eggs at the bottom of this waterfall, they're gonna get flushed into the ocean, they're gonna die. No more opu fish, it goes extinct. It has to lay its eggs upstream of this waterfall in this, on this island. It lives nowhere else. Now, how? I use this example whenever I teach in these um, schools overseas, especially over in the South Pacific, because they understand islands and water and fish and so on. And I'll, I'll often ask the students, and uh, one of the answers I always get is that maybe it flies, because they've heard of flying fish. The problem is flying fish don't fly. They just have special fins that are designed that if they are extended, they can jump and they'll glide for as much as 100 feet out of the water, but they'll never get more than about 10 feet above the waves. They couldn't fly 400 feet up, they can't flap wings. So that doesn't work. And sometimes students will say, well, maybe it climbs, and I'm thinking, yeah, right, like with arms and legs like Spider-Man, and they all laugh, because they realize, well, that doesn't make sense, it just has fins, how's it gonna climb? But they're close. There's another movie, uh, and I know a lot of people have seen the Mission Impossible movies, where Ethan Hunt puts like suction cups on his hands and he climbs uh, a skyscraper in Dubai. This is the only fish in the world, instead of fins underneath of it, it has a suction cup. God designed a fish with a suction cup on its stomach. So this fish will swim up to the bottom of that waterfall, and it will stick itself to the wall. Whoop! And then it will shove with its fins and stick the cup. Shove it up, stick the cup. Shove it up, stick the cup. And over a matter of days, it will climb 420 feet to the top of the waterfall, up that sheer rock surface, jump into the water, swim upstream, lay its eggs. They'll become little fishlings, grow a little bigger, then get flushed back down and go out into the ocean, and then repeat the process the next time. Now, now, evolution can't explain. I mean, imagine a little baby fish is born one day, and it has a suction cup. And it's like, oh, wonder what this is for. Hey, mama, what's this thing on my stomach? Oh, I don't know. You should go stick yourself to the wall and climb up that waterfall. Well, if it needed to do that, it would have already died. All that wasted energy and effort if it didn't need it, and if it didn't have it and it did need it, it would have died. It all has to be there, all at once, or nothing would have worked. The fish could have never survived. It's been designed that way. And remember, you can't get two fins to fuse together and form a suction cup just by random. Everything has to be perfect, and it's all coded information in the DNA, along with the instincts of what to do with it. So obviously a design of God. Um, then there's a fish that's like the world's greatest artist. Like the Michelangelo of the fish world. Watch what this fish can do.
These shackles are just punished to be removed. Please stop to decorate the bridges of this instruction. Narrator is David Edinburgh. He's an evolutionist. He explains all that by saying that thing at the end. You know, this this fish it created this beautiful sculpture so that it can attract a babe, and then they can lay eggs and you know fertilize them. That's why it does all this. Oh, well, that explains it. It has a useful function, but it doesn't. It, that's all fantasy. That's that tour guide pretending Michelangelo's ceiling made itself. That fish has to work 24 hours a day nonstop for a week. And it's just shoving around sand with its head and it makes a perfect circle. And by the way, when I show that film to a kids in a school over in Fiji or the Philippines and there's a thousand kids in the auditorium, when the camera pans out and it shows that whole circle, I will hear a gasp that sounds like, oh, the breath being sucked out. They are so stunned at the beauty of what this little fish could do. I feel like... We've just seen so much cool stuff, we lose our awe of what God has done. That would be like us using our head to shove around sand the diameter of this entire church building without ever looking up and making a perfect circle. No human being could do what that fish does. God designed it to do that. And for a hundred years, the textbooks and the evolutionists have been saying, oh, beauty is just there because it, it's, it, evolution gives it an advantage. In other words, cow, flowers are so beautiful, so, but it, so it'll attract insects and they'll be um, fertilized and better. Except insects are colorblind. It all turned out to be just a story that wasn't even true. Uh, here's another one. Uh, Charles Darwin made this statement. Remember, he's trying to get rid of God. And yet he looks around him and he sees beautiful things like peacocks. He says, the feather, the sight of a feather in a peacock when I see it makes me sick. Why? Because he couldn't explain it. Well, since then, they just said, well, birds are so beautiful, peacocks are so beautiful because the male has really pretty feathers to attract a female. The fish makes a beautiful sculpture to attract a female. It's a story. Well, it turns out, about 10 years ago, they tested this with a peacock. They took a male peacock, whoops, here it is, and they cut off all those beautiful iridescent eye-shaped feathers. So now it's just got a bunch of stalks sticking up without all the beautiful little colored eyes. So it's a pug, ugly male. And then they sent it out in a field with a bunch of really good-looking guys with all their beautiful colors. So there's just dozens of peacocks running around there. One of them's really ugly. The rest of them are really good-looking guys. Then they send in the peahens, the females. Didn't make a bit of difference. 
The beauty had nothing to do with which one of the peacocks they would choose. Beauty exists because it reflects the nature of God himself. And it's there for our benefit and enjoyment. It reflects his nature. It's for our awe. It's so, even in the midst of a fallen creation, we don't forget he's behind it all. Two more examples, and then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, this was just, just quick and cool. Again, it's the only animal, the only vertebrate, an animal with a backbone and a heart in the whole animal kingdom that can do what this animal does. You see, there's a sea iguana that lives on an island in the Pacific, and he has to get his food from the water, but his island is surrounded by coral reefs and sharks. And sharks have lousy eyesight, but really good hearing. And since this guy's about three foot long, he has a heart about half the size of my fist, and it's really loud underwater. It's going boom, 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 boom. Doesn't sound like anything else in the water. And the sharks just zero right in on it, and they, here's, here's a big old bratwurst sandwich. And they have a really good, juicy meal, because they can find him really easy. So George and Frank are sitting there, and Frank goes in for a swim, and it's like a shark goes, whoop! There goes his brother. He's thinking, man, I'm really hungry, but if I go out there, I'm going to get eaten. So guess what he does? He turns off his heart, shuts it down. It's no longer beating. Then he goes in and goes swimming. Okay, gets lots of food, catches lots of fish. Uh, turns out this iguana can turn off its heart for 20 minutes and swim with no flowing blood, no oxygen to its muscles, nothing going to its brain uh, while it's swimming around and no heartbeat. Then it crawls back up out of there and it dies. No more iguana. Because it forgot to evolve the ability to turn its heart back on. No. Just turns its heart back on. Isn't that stunning? It, uh, something that can turn its heart back on and turn it off whenever it wants to. There have to be thousands of changes to this animal to make that possible. To function without the oxygen, without the lungs pump, bringing in oxygen, without the blood flowing, and he's still able to do everything it needs to do. It's designed that way. Okay, last little critter, and then I'm going to wrap up with a final example. My favorite bird, because it's not called the bar-tailed evolution wit. It's the bar-tailed god wit. Now, this bird, again, can do what no other bird can do. It lives in the summer in Alaska, which is like a smorgasbord of food. Plankton bloom, whales head up there, birds head up there, all sorts of animals head up there. They're all eating everything in sight for months in the summer. But in the winter, it's this barren, frozen wasteland, so things have to migrate. Well, this bird flies 7,000 miles nonstop across the open ocean to New Zealand. But if you look at the bird, it's got these long, spindly legs. It's not like a seagull. It can't swim very well. And if it lands in the water, its wings aren't built that it can take off from water. So if it ever lands on its way to New Zealand, it's going to drown. So it can't stop for 7,000 miles. Well, scientists, they did the calculation and they realized this bird doesn't have enough body fat to fly that far because they know exactly how much energy it uses every time it flaps its wings. And it is impossible for it to fly nonstop for 7,000 miles. But it does. I thought, well, this is, how does it do that? And I like science. It's, it's like God told us to go figure things out and understand them. Well, it turns out it takes between five and seven days, depending on the, uh, the jet stream. It eats like crazy for two weeks before it leaves. So it gains 55% in body fat. In, so now it's like the Goodyear blimp. And it's still not very efficient because now it's like a big old blimp and it still wouldn't be able to get there even though it has a lot more fat because now it's not moving efficiently through the air. So what's it do? The bird for the last week takes all that fat, its body eliminates the water and it turns like a real hard like um, beef tallow. So it's super concentrated fat. But it's still too big. It still looks way overweight. 
So for the last few days, all of its internal organs shrivel up. Its intestines go paper thin, its stomach goes paper thin, its liver, all of all, its kidneys, all of them get packed in there and then the fat takes up that space and now it's nice and streamlined again. It replaces all of its organs with, with, with fuel. Its whole body is a fuel tank. And then it can fly 7,000 miles. Isn't that cool? Think of all the changes that are needed. They all had to be programmed. If any of those things weren't there to begin with, it would be on its journey, it would run out of fuel, nosedive into the ocean, no more Godwits. But it's all designed for our wonder and amazement. And then there's all these animals that can light up. It's called chemiluminescence. There's, there's uh, uh, jellyfish with a myriad of colors. And by the way, every different color of chemiluminescence is a different set of chemicals. There's two basic kinds. There's luciferin and luciferess. They're named after Lucifer, the angel of light. But you've got to mix them together to form light chemically. And we see them in these light sticks that we buy. Um, here are plankton that have those chemicals. And when the water hits the beach, the plankton mix the chemicals together and the whole beach shimmers with light. There aren't any floodlights on that beach. Those are the little plankton lighting up. In the Amazon, there are mushrooms that glow green. You're walking along, there's a bunch of green glowing mushrooms. It, in the ocean, there are squid that have green, orange, blue, white, all different colors of light, and they can turn them on and off so they look like a strobe show running across the backs of these squids as they swim along. Really, really cool. Deep in the ocean, there are these fish that have a light on the end of a stock where there's no light reaches down there. It's so deep. And the other fish see that light and they're thinking, wonder what that light is. Well, they're about to find out because they're going to get eaten. And the one we know of the best are these lightning bugs. Just, just they, 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 they light up their back ends. Now, this is where I wrapped up. My whole point tonight, all of us have issues. All of us have problems. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Christianity isn't about, oh, God, take it all away. It's about, God, how can I trust you more? And, and it's just this awe. Don't lose the awe. Don't just say ho-hum when you see these things. No, like you know nothing else. None of this could be there unless he designed it for our benefit, knowledge, enjoyment, and understanding that he's behind it all. And if God can put a light bulb on the butt of a bug, I mean, think about this. He put a light bulb on the butt of a bug. Don't you think he's capable of taking care of your problems? He is. And if he hasn't, he's trying to develop something in us. Trust him. And this is all this verse says. It's my final verse. We are the children of light. We're the ones reflecting God's truth and light, and he's given us that responsibility. We're the children of the day, not of the night, not of darkness. The darkness, you can't make something darker by bringing in dark. Darkness is only there because the light has been removed. So just keep it in your life and share it with others. Be sober. Have that breastplate of faith and love for others in a helmet, not just the hope of salvation, but the, not, the absolute assurance of your salvation. And, um, and all of these resources, the books, this Rocks Crowd video set, those little two-minute videos, they're all there because the world is blind to all this. They're busy hiding from God. They've been deceived. Not everybody out there is out to deceive. They've just been deceived, and they're blinded by what they've heard over and over and over again that leaves God out. All these little examples are like putting a pebble in their shoe where they think God's not involved, but he's involved in everything. And you point out these examples, it's this little bit of knowledge and wonder that they have to deal with. And God and his spirit can use it to reach them. And uh, as, like I said, the videos, the Rocks Cry Out series, the devotionals, they're just these little examples that I think God will bring back to you over time, and you can use them in conversations. And 
help move people toward that faith in God and God's word. And then if there's enough of them, the whole shoe becomes filled with rocks and people just can't get rid of it. So, so that's my prayer and my goal and my hope is that you'll take this stuff and God will help you use it with others to lead others to him. So thank you again for having me this